We've all witnessed a movie that left us scratching our heads in disbelief. The peculiar thing is, someone at some time thought for some unexplainable reason, making that movie was a worthwhile idea. What were they thinking? One such movie was the 1963 black and white horror classic, The Slime People. I'm old man Kelly and I can't help myself. I need to know the story, the who's, the when's and the why's. Now The Slime People starts with a man named Joseph F. Robertson. I couldn't find a picture of him, but he's one of these two people. I'm going to assume he's this guy. Joe was a producer and director who lived from 1925 to 2001. He had an interesting career. After serving in the Marines during World War II, he majored in international banking and finance at New York University. Eventually, he became a show accountant for George Burns Production Company. And from there, he moved into producing low-budget horror films, and that led to a career in pornography. Yes, Mr. Robertson would direct hardcore porn films under the name Adele Robbins. He even directed Edward D. Wood Jr. in films like Mrs. Stone's Thing and Love Beast. But much earlier, the first two films he produced was this one, The Slime People, and The Crawling Hand, which he made right after. The story of The Crawling Hand can be found in a previous Old Man Kelly video. He said in an interview with film historian Tom Weaver that he read a script called The Slime People by Vance Scarsdead and bought it. Vance was an actor who mostly did TV work but wrote the occasional screenplay. Though in a newspaper from June 3, 1963, Robert Hutton, the star, co-producer, and director of The Slime People, said the name of the film under its initial release was The Burrowers. He said, When the distributor tried it out in a number of Midwest towns, it was a flop. Nobody understood why until the exhibitor told us what was wrong. The picture, he said, was fine. But The Burrowers was a terrible title. All right, maybe for a documentary about rabbits, but for a horror movie, no so the distributors withdrew the picture while they thought of a new title. Then somebody had an inspiration. Let's call it The Slime People, he said. That did it. When they tried out the picture under that title, it was a roaring success. But I'm not sure about that, since Robertson said the script he bought was called The Slime People, but your guess is as good as mine. Anyway, Robertson's wife at the time, Blair Robertson, who lived from 1923 to 2002, wrote the script. About the two writers of the film, Blair Robertson and Vance Scarstead, Hutton said they wrote under made-up names because they didn't want the credit, and I don't blame them. But Robertson, when asked by Tom Weaver if those were made-up names, said, Oh, no, no. Vance Scarstead was the original author, and Blair did the rewriting. The director and star of the film was Robert Hutton. Robert was born Robert Bruce Wynn and lived from 1920 to 1994. He was from New York and had the good fortune, when he was young, of looking a lot like Jimmy Stewart. So his career really benefited when Stewart left Hollywood to fight in World War II. Hutton began getting parts that probably would have gone to Stewart. By the time he made The Slime People, he was starring in films like The Man Without a Body in 1957, The Colossus of New York in 1958, and The Invisible Invaders in 1959. Robertson hired Hutton because he knew that Hutton was anxious to direct, but probably, and more importantly, would do it for very little money. Hutton found that directing was a bit harder than he thought. He said, I found out that directing was not that simple of a job. There were a lot of things I didn't know and I don't think I'd ever want to do it again. But I did it and had fun. And I did, I suppose, as much as anybody could do with the amount of money we had, which was nothing. As far as directing, Susan Hart, who played Lisa Galbraith, the older daughter, said, To me, he was a good director. Anybody would have been a good director. I had never done a film before. He was not only directing, but he was also starring, so I suppose he was as good as anybody was able to be doing both those jobs. But Judy Morton, who played the younger sister Bonnie, said, He was a nice person, Robert Hutton. He didn't direct. The only direction he did on the show that I remember was, You stand there and you stand there, and you look happy and you look sad. There wasn't any real coaching as I would know today. And she said, 
we were expected just to show up, hit our spots, and say the right dialogue. Now, Judy Morton was born in 1940, and as of this recording, is still with us. Although this was her first major acting role, she did do a bit of TV work before the slime people. Hi, Marjorie. Hello. Where's your date, Wally? That's all right, Timmy. Maybe they'll make an exception. It's very exciting, even if it is just an educational film. Yeah. I should imagine he would be. I'll go out to the Ponderosa right away and see little Joe. Oh, now, wait a minute, Karen. Anyway, while going to school at UCLA, she took a job with the agent William Scholler and would see scripts come through. When she saw one for the slime people, which had parts for two teenage sisters, she thought, I can do that. She told her friend Susan Hart, and they both went down for an audition and were hired. Susan Hart was born Dorothy Nade Hart on June 2, 1941 in Wenatchee, Washington. Like Judy, she did a bit of TV work before the slime people. Yeah, and then this joker grabs us. What kind of a town you got here anyway? Uh, Drop the sweet talk, Buster, and let's hear the big fat lie you've made up to con me out of going to the dance. Don't bother. I'm really not interested in the contest one way or another. Robert Hutton said of Hart, She had a sweater on and she looked good, and I didn't ask her to read her anything. I said, you've got the part, and that was it. She was attractive, and I knew she was going to photograph well. She continued her career after the slime people, appearing in films like Pajama Party from 64, Dr. Goldfoot in the Bikini Machine from 65, and The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini from 66. All done by American International Pictures, which makes sense because she was married to James H. Nicholson, co-founder of AIP. The young hero of the film was Cal Johnson, played by William Boyce. Boyce lived from 1932 to 2013. According to Robert Hutton, he didn't know anything about motion pictures. I think Joe Robertson found him walking down the street one day and asked him if he wanted to be in movies. The guy said yeah, and that was it. Judy Morton said Boyce was a great salesman who lied about everything. According to this article in 1963, Bill was to have a part in Joseph F. Robertson's next film called Terror is a Creeping Thing, but as far as I know, the film was never made. He had a bit part in the movie The Comic with Dick Van Dyke in 1969, but that was his only other credit. I believe he retired and went into real estate. The part of Professor Galbraith was played by Robert Burton, who lived from 1895 to 1962. The part was originally to be played by Richard Arland, who had been a big star back in the day, but right before the film was to begin, Robert Hutton received a phone call while lying in bed saying that Arland was very sick in the hospital and would not be able to be in the film. So right away he called Robert Burton, who agreed to do it. He was a good actor who had a long career starting in 1950. But what he didn't tell anyone was he was sick, dying of cancer, and he passed away shortly after the film was completed. On a side note, Richard Ireland would recover and appear in The Crawling Hand. The last actor I'll talk about is Les Tremaine, who played the goat-loving Norman Tolliver. Les lived from 1913 to 2003. He was more known for his voice than his acting, being the narrator in many films or film trailers. But he was also in films like War of the Worlds from 1953, The Monolith Monsters from 57, The Monster of Piedras Blancas from 59, and The Angry Red Planet also from 59. And he also did a lot of TV work. Susan Hart called him a real gentleman. A few cameos in the film, writer Blair Robertson played Mrs. Castillo and Joseph F. Robertson and Edward Finch Adams, who was an associate producer, played the two bums in the projection room. I'm not sure if this was a Hitchcock-like cameo or a cost-saving effort. The production company for the film was Hutton Robertson Productions, a company formed by Robert Hutton and Joseph F. Robertson. Hutton said they formed their own company with the idea to make a lot of movies, but it didn't turn out that way. So the film had no money behind it. It was financed by a fellow named Don Hansen, who was a friend of Robertson. He owned a propane company and a string of laundrettes. According to Robertson, the budget was $56,000, which in his own words was nothing. Robert Hutton said, I knew I was in way over my head and tried to fake it. 
In making the movie, I went to all my friends because we couldn't afford to pay any kind of salary. The Slime People costumes cost about $600 a piece, and they only could afford eight of them. Robertson said he had to raise the money on a day-to-day -day basis. Robert Hutton said, I never got a penny. I never received a first paycheck for the movie, and we just couldn't quit while we were doing it. This isn't the only time I wasn't paid. Susan Hart said, I did get paid for the first week, and we even had a makeup person the first week. All of a sudden, in the second week, we all started doing our own makeup, and people started disappearing, like lighting men and carpenters. All of a sudden, the crew was down to maybe seven, not counting the monsters. Two of the stuntmen who played slime people said they never got paid either. Robert Hutton said of one of the men in the monster costume, the man who played the monster the most often was a friend of Robertson's, and he was drunk the whole time. He was very good as the slime man because he stumbled around and it looked real good. He also had a couple of bucks in the picture. Judy said, there were times when they forgot the camera. There were times when they didn't have film. You can't imagine the things that went wrong while making that film. Apparently, they also had little people playing bowls, which were supposed to be an advanced unit for the slime people, but it didn't work out. Robertson said they were terrible and it was a fiasco, so it was cut from the film. According to Susan Hart, one day after filming, she and Judy Morton, her sister in the film, and also her roommate, got home and argued about who did the most screaming. But according to Judy, both girls were young and inexperienced and were just happy to be working on a film. In fact, almost everybody who worked on the film said it was a lot of fun. Judy said, it was fun while making it. Everybody was friendly and lovely to be around. Robertson, who Hutton called completely crazy like a little boy, said, I was very happy. I was very young and I was amazed that we could get anything on film. I would see a day screening and say, my God, it's actually on film. It's being projected. The film took about three weeks to shoot. They shot at the KTTV studios in Hollywood, the Whitman Airfield in Bacoima, and an actual butcher shop that belonged to Hutton's father-in-law. There are quick shots of the city in ruins at the beginning, and I assumed those were from stock footage, but according to Hutton, there was a fire in Bel Air that destroyed some beautiful mansions, including those owned by Burt Lancaster and Zsa Zsa Gabor. Joe quickly got a hold of Hutton, and they shot some footage of the devastation. So what is the slime people? It opens with a dead body on the beach, and now we know we're going for a ride. Cut to a plane piloted by Tom Gregory flying through a lot of fog on his way to Los Angeles. And oh yes, get ready for a lot of fog. He lands at an airport and finds it empty. And a car pulls up with three people, Professor Gulbrath and his two daughters, Lisa and Bonnie. They explain that the area is now covered with some sort of dome and slime people have risen from under the earth and are taking over. Tom, of course, doesn't believe it. So to prove it, they show Tom the city in ruins and a crashed car with some dead bodies. I know something has happened, but uh, have you ever seen these uh, slime people? Tom is a newspaper man and he takes the family to the KTTV studios where they watch some newsreels trying to learn more. Here's the late bulletin, ladies and gentlemen. Twelve persons have been found murdered on and near the beaches tonight. All beach communities are being alerted. If you are in the beach area, do not leave your home. As soon as they finish watching the footage, oh no, they're attacked by drunken looters. Running away, they see slime people rising up from under the earth, so they continue to run. Inside, they meet a handsome young soldier, Calvin Johnson. The five barely escape using a fire extinguisher. Now inside a TV studio with a living room set, they attempt to use the TV broadcast to communicate to the outside world, to those on the other side of the dome. If anybody's listening, this is no joke. I'm a Marine. I was fighting these slime people and was knocked out. I guess they thought I was dead and left me there. The slime people made a fog and the fog turned to a wall. If anyone knows how to get through this thing, 
then I'm sure that there's a few other people just like us. They fail and so they spend their night in the studio. During the night, Bunny makes her feelings towards Cal known. Of course, they just met, but there has to be a love story. Hey, it's the end of the world. Who has time to wait? And this is a soldier who says things like, gee whiz. Gee whiz. You know, as long as you're sitting here, I, I don't even want to think about slime people. The next morning, Cal and Bonnie go out to get supplies that the professor needs to battle these slime people. Back in the TV studio, Tom and the professor make plans while, of course, Lisa makes coffee. Oh wait, now Tom has feelings for Lisa? Keep in mind that Lisa is played by a 21-year-old woman and Tom, well, he's 43. Anyway, they leave and almost run into Cal and Bonnie. And then they meet Norman Tolliver, a troublemaking writer who is a goat for a girlfriend. Hey, as long as the relationship is consensual, who am I to judge? Now is it me, or the minute we see a man holding a goat, we know he's going to be a victim? Anyway, he doesn't believe any of the slime people nonsense. Tolliver, have you heard of the slime people? <laughs> of course. It's all a lot of nonsense. I've been right over there in my cabin all the time and I haven't seen a one of them. They head out to the wall, which can't be seen due to the fog. Or is it because of the budget? Like I said, there's a lot of fog. They want to find out what they are up against. Now the slime people are hanging around watching the survivors, but eventually they attack and the humans run. The ladies are still carrying their purses. On the way, Tolliver learns the truth and has a breakdown. They see some other survivors, but quickly turn and run away. I guess they are assumed to be looters and therefore dangerous? I mean, it seems to me there are strength in numbers, but what do I know? I guess it makes sense because they probably want Tom's car. Our heroes run out of gas in front of a butcher shop where turkey legs are only 35 cents. Unfortunately, and we all saw it coming, Tolliver becomes a victim of the slime people. But later, the professor figures out something. Because Tom's plane touched the ocean, or almost touched the ocean as he was flying into town, and he made it through the dome, sodium chloride must be the answer. Well, what's sodium chloride? Sodium chloride is table salt. That could break the wall and defeat the slime people, he figures. Seems a bit thin to me, but hey, I'm not a scientist. Tom says... Why don't we find everything we can to make a vehicle? But that'll take hours. So they jump to work, covering a board with sheets or towels or something. I'm not really sure what they are doing. I'm confused, but whatever it is, it'll take hours, and Cal thinks that is way too long. So, against the professor's orders, he goes out to find a car. Bonnie decides to tag along. Cal gets ahead of Bonnie, and a dumpster diving slime person grabs her. Cal doesn't notice. Come on, Bonnie, scream or something. We all know you have a good set of lungs with all the screaming you do later. Oh no, not Bonnie. I think they've taken her, probably to try and lure us out in the open. I will point out that the slime people look pretty slow and clumsy, but still, I guess they are scary. Oh, and don't worry about Bonnie. Although the slime people have killed everyone they meet, for some reason they only kidnap her. And back inside, no one seems all that upset at Cal. I mean, he left when he shouldn't and took Bonnie with him, resulting in her capture and possible death, and everybody seems okay with it. So Cal and Tom go for the rescue, and talk about finding a needle in a haystack, they find a bit of her blonde hair, in a field, in a thick fog. They battle the monsters, find the machine that makes the dome, and finally rescue Bonnie. Talk about a good day. So the four end up going back, now armed with buckets of salt that they make the ladies carry. Will they defeat the slime people? Oh, and I assume Tom was out of bullets because he decided to use his rifle as a club to fight the slime people. In fact, I don't think I ever saw him fire his gun. 
Now, as you can imagine, I have some problems with this film. Now, I'm going to accept the premise that creatures from a subterranean Earth created a dome around Los Angeles and a small group of people are fighting for survival. I did like the look of the slime people, but I couldn't help wonder what was their end game? Are they just hoping to return to the surface and have LA for themselves? Do they want to make movies? But the real issue is, well, if they're smart enough to build a machine that can create a dome around an entire city, why do they carry spears as weapons? Surely they would have had something a little more advanced, don't you think? And I'm sure there are military bases in and around L.A. The Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and even the Coast Guard. And I know the story goes that the slime people defeated all of the military, but really? A handful of clumsy underground dwelling reptiles with pointy sticks? When you think that a handful of survivors were able to destroy the wall with one of their spears and defeat the beasts, think what one rocket launcher could have done. And the salt thing really doesn't work and it goes nowhere. It doesn't get them through the wall or kill the monsters. Salt does not win the day. Oh, Dad, why did all of this have to happen to us? Well, how would I make the film better? I would start at the beginning, before the invasion. You know, something unknown is killing people. Creepy, slimy hands come out of the sewer, grabbing the legs of pretty women like in the movie Chud. At first we don't see the slime people, but eventually they are discovered. Now I'm thinking the reason the movie has the dome was to limit the number of actors in the film. So I would set it in an isolated town out in the desert or something, like in Tremors. And maybe the only bridge to out of town has been destroyed so there's no way out, like in The Evil Dead 2. Oh, and I would kill off a likable character early in the film, like in Psycho. Okay, that one really doesn't work, but you get the general idea. Killing a likable character early gives the film real stakes. The audience knows no one is safe. Maybe Tom could have had a wife who gets killed, and that makes Tom's character a little more dramatic, and maybe that could lead to a sacrifice at the end. Hey, I'm just spitballing here. And a couple of more things. Give the ladies something to do rather than scream, make coffee and carry buckets of salt. And this might be me, but an adult woman shouldn't call their father daddy. That should stop at around age eight. Daddy! 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 Why should you watch this? This shot alone is worth the price of admission. To see Robert Hutton doing his best macho John Wayne walk. And then there are the two young ladies. Every bit of their inexperience shows up on film and that, in a strange way, is enjoyable to see. And I'm not being mean. Both have stated that they are extremely embarrassed by this film. Susan Hart talks about seeing this film for the first time with her brother. But I remember seeing it the first time and badgering my brother over and over. Oh, please, Don, can we leave now? I was so embarrassed, not so much because of the film, but because I did a lot of things that were so stupid. And she's talking about her acting choices. And Judy said, I vaguely remember seeing this film for the first time and I remember how disappointed I was. Oh my God, did we look that bad? And Susie and I were just hysterical. We were trying not to laugh out loud at ourselves because there I was bouncing along and she was doing the same thing, looking happy and bubbly, trying to get through the dialogue, to do whatever it was we had to do and we thought at the time we were doing a good job and it was just awful. It was painful to watch. But I'll give you one great reason to watch this movie, Les Tremaine. He's the best part of the film. He was a treasure and just fun to watch. Probably in there, falling over his own feet, lying in undated in his own blood. Wait a minute, Lisa! Lisa! Bonnie! <laughs> One last thing. I would say if you're going to watch this film, I would watch it with the Mystery Science Theater 3000 commentary. Because there's a lot of slow, talky-talk scenes. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs>